So good afternoon. I guess this is the first time that we're going to be doing a webinar. So we get to look at a new plant family. And uh, this is uh, going to be a very important one. So last time we saw the poppy family and the poppy family gave us some of the medicine. And prior to that, we saw the mustard family, and that gave us some vegetables. And prior to that, we saw the mint family, and that gave us some of our uh, uh, herbs and spices. And so today we get to see the family that is going to be more important for fruits. And that is going to be the rose family. And obviously roses are going to be one of the world's most important plant. Uh, they are going to be cultivated by many people and uh, they are going to, they have been cultivated for many, many years. And so on the screen, you have a shot of uh, the Rockefeller Rose Garden uh, that I took photograph when I was in New York. And just to show you some of the roses that are going to uh, be planted. And so what we're looking at is the Rosaceae, uh, the rose family uh, spread out throughout the world. And uh, United the genera, 25, uh, 20 species. So obviously we are only going to see the ones that are a lot more important to us. Uh, but it is a great family. And uh, like we've seen before, uh, we are going to divide it into several of uh, several subfamilies, uh, Rosoides, Amalegoides, Maloides, Rhyoroides. Uh, so only a few of them are going to be important for food. But if we look at the rosoides to begin with, uh, here is a wild rose flower. And uh, one of the things that we can see is that wild rose flowers have five petals. Now that might be different from the cultivated hybrids uh, because those have, those have not have changed. So there's some sepals. Uh, we have some sepals that are gonna be five that will protect the flowers. And there's gonna be many uh, stamens uh, throughout and then uh, that one or several stigmas that may be found within the rose uh, flower itself. So keep this in mind because this will change as we have uh, seen with other plants. And so one of the ways that people have achieved getting those multi-petal roses is by gradually changing the stamens into uh, a petal, a petal-like structure. So the stamens on a flower is a modified leaf. And so the petals are also modified leaves. And so they can manipulate them and they can revert them to being a leaf-like structure. In this case, turns back into a petal or turns into a petal. And that is how this variety of different roses that are obviously going to be very important for Mother's Day. Uh, so that's how they eventually got to them. Uh, and uh, we have now our double delight, which uh, shows you all the petals. And if you look at the center, there are no stamens. So over time, as the stamens change into a petal-like structure, they become sterile. And so the plant is for all purposes, it's a sterile individual that can only be uh, continue on by people. So it is a human made product. And uh, here's, um, I think this might be Mr. Lincoln uh, showing you exactly that. Uh, and uh, here is a wild uh, form. This is Rosa viridiflora or the green flower. And so you can see the petals uh, on this old fashioned rose are not colorful, they're very greenish. So they do carry out photosynthesis. Uh, and uh, those could eventually change. Uh, but this is a wild rose, uh, oh, not a wild form, an old fashioned rose. And uh, here's a close up of uh, uh, 
uh, that, that rose. Uh, the pollination is going to be important and it's going to be mainly by bees uh, and or other insects. So the petals will form a nice landing platform. The stamens do provide lots of pollen and uh, uh, the flowers will also secrete uh, nectar. And this is where the European honeybee does come in handy because most of the fruits that we're going to see today do not have their origin in America. It is European Asia where the European or the honeybee is uh, native to. And so yes, when we are looking at the decline of the honeybees, uh, we are risking losing uh, some of the quantities of the fruits that we can grow. Uh, and now here we have a flower fly, flower fly uh, that is eating the pollen on uh, this uh, cherry. Uh, there is something very important that I want to bring out, uh, specifically with this family, like we've seen with others that are some things that are unique. Uh, when we cut this flower bud in half, we can see something very important. Uh, we can see the petals before they open, uh, the uh, sepals, we can see the stamens, and then we can see uh, the different carpels uh, or the different compartments, each of them with uh, their own stigma. But very important with this, this, uh, with this family is the base of the petals and the sepals, which is known as the hypanthium, or for a common term, it is the floral tube. So the hypanthium, you need to keep it in mind because the position of this floral tube or the ovaries in relationship to the petals and sepals will become very, very important. So I want you to keep in mind hypanthium, floral tube, uh, that will play a very important role later on. Uh, that over time is going to turn into what is known as the rose hip, uh, which when we look at the rose hip, the fleshy portion is the hypanthium. So those, the basis of those uh, petals and sepals, uh, the top already gone, done their job. The stamens, gone, done their job. And so what we find is that uh, the real fruit for a rose is not the hip. The hip is just the vessel that is hiding the fruit, which is gonna be, in this case, an akin, uh, exactly like uh, we saw with uh, the sunflowers. Uh, so like a sunflower seed, a single uh, seed individual. And you can see here where you have the remnants of the style that lead to some of those individuals akin. And uh, here is that fleshy hypanthium that for all purposes, it will play the role of a contractive agent. So it's going to attract uh, the animal to disperse uh, the, the seeds uh, and or the fruits later on. Uh, here are the individual fruits. So some of them that were uh, pollinated and fertilized, so those are the bigger ones, and some of the ones that were not, uh, but you see uh, the remnants of uh, that uh, style. Obviously, roses are very important. Uh, there is a rose water, which is very good if you've never had it. Uh, it's good use for a lot of uh, Mediterranean desserts or uh, Lebanese. Uh, there is the rose petal tea. Uh, that has been used for many, many, many years. Uh, and uh, here's uh, some of them. Uh, obviously, Mother's Day uh, is going to be around the corner. So make sure that you take your mom some roses. I know we are in quarantine, but that's okay. Uh, so roses, send them, deliver, free delivery should be available uh, to them. Here's some of the uh, roses in cultivation for the cut, uh, cut flower industry. Uh, most of the roses are gonna be coming from South America, Ecuador, and uh, Colombia. This photograph from Colombia, when I had the opportunity to visit. Uh, so they are grafted, they are being grown for the flower under protection. Uh, and uh, some of them are gonna be in bags. And uh, here I am just to show you that I, I was there. 
uh, with the person that was giving us the tour. Uh, those are then going to be processed. Uh, here's where they have cut them and now they are bundling them. Uh, and uh, they are uh, ready to ship. Uh, from Colombia, they'll go into Florida, and eventually from Florida, they'll make it into the rest of the United States. Uh, here's some of the climbing roses uh, that you may see out there uh, with a, a nice variegation on the foliage. And there's a different view of that. Or in the garden, uh, when we return, we have the lady banks, the yellow lady banks here uh, with uh, the climbing and not spining and stinging. Uh, and there's the flowers uh, for that. Or some of the David Austin climbing roses. Uh, David Austin is another breather type. So within this category, we also have the genus Fragaria, which we begin to see some of the important fruits. This is going to be the strawberries. Uh, we do have native strawberries here to California, and uh, most of the strawberries that we eat uh, the store-bought strawberries are a hybrid from a European and a California type uh, strawberry. The European uh, make the natural habitat as a forest floor plant, so underneath shade. The California makes its home in the, as a sand dune uh, up north. Uh, and so when they were hybridized, uh, the resulting was a plant that could survive outdoors in the middle of nowhere or in the open field and uh, bear a much better quality fruit. So here is uh, the flower, the close-up of the flowers, uh, and uh, uh, here is uh, the different parts. So you have the sepals, and then uh, we have the different carpels, which in the individual stigmas, and even a lot of the stamens. So when we cut that in half, we are going to see now something different. And that for strawberries, it is going to be the receptacle. Uh, the receptacle which holds the individual ovaries uh, or ovaries, uh, compartments, carpals, uh, and the stigmas uh, will become important because as the fruit develops, we can see the Receptacle uh, in white holding the immature fruit here and the remnants of uh, the stigma and style. So with strawberries, uh, the fruit is once again, is an akin. So every single individual uh, that you see here is the fruit of the strawberry, the white portion that eventually as it begins to mature will turn red is nothing more than the receptacle, uh, the receptacle that is now holding the mature uh, fruits right here that you normally are gonna chuck or throw them away or if you chew them, they're gonna be crunchy or you can plant them and you can grow more strawberries, but most people obviously do not do that. So for strawberries, when you eat the fruit, you're eating a receptacle. Uh, obviously, it's going to be a very good industry, so strawberries should be on the market. Uh, here's some wild strawberries, so there's still wild strawberries that are found uh, throughout different parts of the world. Uh, this one is from Ecuador. And uh, the fruit, although not as big as a cultivated form, uh, it's still sweet. And uh, this is the field of strawberries. So. And the characteristic of California allow them to grow out in the field and still bear a good amount of a harvest and yields. And there's some of the strawberries as they are getting ready to be picked and ready for the market. Uh, and uh, there's some more. Uh, here's a raised bed. This is uh, from Colombia. So in my trip, I happened to see it. And they are grown in bags. Uh, one of the biggest problems with strawberry is going to be rain uh, as they mature and uh, the ground that has a lot of uh, pathogens, uh, mold that begins to turn them gray and then uh, eventually they rot. Uh, and so by lifting them, it makes it uh, say, uh, better for them to avoid any soil-borne pathogen as well as the labor. So the labor of uh, bending down, uh, and uh, picking them becomes less strenuous for the workers. 
Uh, we have uh, strawberry jam, jellies, and uh, a bunch of other products, including dry strawberries uh, that you can find in the market, and uh, strawberry cream waffle wafers, and all kinds of different products uh, that have a strawberry on them. Uh, there are some other colorful strawberries. So most of the wild forms will have a yellow, a white flower, sorry. Uh, but there's now some pink ones that are out there. And uh, uh, Gium is a different genus. Uh, looks very similar to a strawberry, but this one does not have that edible fruit. Uh, this one comes from uh, South America, from Chile. Uh, but the flowers look almost the same. And here's a multi-petal individual. And uh, Potentilia, or commonly known as Singfoil, uh, we'll put that one in the list later on because that is used as a ground cover throughout Southern California. And uh, it's a yellow form. Uh, there are a few other shrubby like Potentilia, uh, such as this one. Uh, and you can see uh, the strawberry looking flowers. Uh, and then uh, Wilstingia fragoides, uh, this is uh, another genera from Europe. Uh, and uh, it's very different than any of the other ones, just to show you something weird. Uh, and then Sagisorba, uh, Salad Bernay. Uh, here is uh, the flowers. Uh, you can see all the stamens and the stigma will be in there. So Salad Bernay is a member of the rose family, as well as uh, Rubus. Uh, which is going to be the genera that is going to give us uh, the blackberries, raspberries, alleloberries, and all of those. Uh, so there is going to be many that will have uh, prickles throughout the stem. And obviously, there's going to be some selections that do not have any prickles. Uh, here's the flower for the blackberry with a beetle uh, as a pollinator there. And so we have uh, similar characteristics of the flowers, just multiple stamens. And uh, here we have a blackberry and a raspberry for uh, comparison. The main difference here is that if you look at the raspberry, uh, it's gonna have a hollow center. So we have the fruitlets that are gonna, you can see the hairs that are gonna be the remnants of the stigma. And on your blackberries, it is not hollow. So when somebody eats a blackberry, they're also eating the receptacle which has fibers, uh, a few more vitamins and minerals. Whereas in your raspberry, you're only eating the fruitless and not the receptacle and anything else. Here's some uh, wild uh, raspberries that I saw in Colombia. And you can see here where they're just, when they're ripened, they just uh, pull off of the receptacle. The receptacle remains behind. And uh, here's where I was pulling them off and you can see the individual fruitless uh, and uh, here's the receptacle on uh, the raspberry with the remnants of the stamens and the sepals. And so when we look at the raspberries and blackberries, uh, this is going to be a different fruit. This is going to be known as an aggregate fruit because every single of these fruitlets uh, is going to be known as a druplet because there's one single seed that will be the crunchy portion and they are aggregated together as one single unit. Uh, so that's why they're referred to as an aggregate fruit, but the actual name uh, for the individual is a druplet, uh, and we'll see the word drup later on with peaches and apricots. Uh, here's uh, the individuals, and you can see the seed uh, that is formed that will germinate, and you can see the remnants of the stigmas uh, right there. And the same thing with the blackberries. When you cut any half, you can see that fleshy receptacle uh, holding the fruitlets. Uh, those are going to be important and found throughout the year. Uh, Nasberry Farm was the one that made our uh, raspberry, and they have a festival uh, and uh, sauce and a bunch of other uses uh, for this great plant. So here's uh, some of the blackberries that I saw in uh, Colombia. So, uh, uh, sorry about the photographs, they're in the back. Uh, here's some uh, wild blackberries uh, that 
Uh, I saw this is from Mexico, and uh, this is probably going to be one of the biggest flowers uh, that I've seen on a blackberry. And uh, there's the fruit. Uh, and uh, part of the California uh, native plants, we have uh, Falugia, which is known as Apache plume. Uh, it's a desert growing, uh, so flowers there, fruit, not edible in this case. And then we have the cream bush uh, holodiscus uh, that makes its home in uh, the Santa Monica Mountains, so in the Chaparral. And uh, this photograph was from one that I took from Griffith Park. And uh, Physocarpus, uh, which is going to be as known as nine bark. Uh, not really good for growing here, but often people look for, for it because uh, the bark is very interesting. Uh, and there's uh, some of the fruits for uh, this one. Uh, and then uh, in the dryoides, we have uh, chamis, which is a native plant to California. Uh, this is uh, part of the coastal uh, and or chaparral uh, photographs here in Griffith Park. And uh, in many areas, it will be the dominant species uh, of, uh, uh, or the dominant plant in uh, the habitat. Uh, so here's uh, the flowers uh, for that. Uh, and in the Maloidioides, the Malus, uh, we're going to have Malus as a type specimen. Uh, this is going to be apples. So apples, here's the apple blossoms because obviously they are share, sharing a compartment. Here's uh, the base of uh, the apple with the sepals and the petals. And uh, here is the cut section of the flower. So same thing, stamen, stigma, sepals, but the hypanthium. Uh, the hypanthium, which becomes important, that is surrounding the ovary uh, uh, that is gonna be inside. So when we begin to see the development of the apple, uh, here's some flowers that have Laser petals because the pollination is done. So the remnants of the petals and everything else. Here is uh, the hypanthium uh, that is now beginning to swell uh, with the remaining remains of the flower part. And so when we have a fully mature apple, this is going to be a fruit known as a palm. That is just the nature of the beast. That's the name. Uh, so when we look at the apple, we're going to see a few things. Uh, on this side, we are going to see the remains uh, of uh, the sepals and uh, the petals and all the other flower part. And uh, this stem is what held the flower, so that will be the receptacle of the flower. So what it holds the remains of the flower part. And so when we cut the apple in half, you're gonna see that the hypanthium, uh, the swollen bases of uh, the petals and the sepals become the edible portion of the apple. What constitute the ovary or the compartments, uh, the carpels of an apple are gonna be what we now refer to as the apple core, which usually you do not bite into it because that's gonna hold the seeds and you have the different compartment. So for purpose, uh, anatomically, the ovary is right here. You can see the arrows kind of pointing at the line, the dividing line, and uh, the floral tube, the hypanthium, the uh, basis of the stamens, the, uh, petals and sepals would be the edible portion. And so this brings a question, should apples be considered a vegetable, not a fruit? The answer is anatomically, because you are eating the base of a petal and sepal. Yes, apples should be a vegetable. Uh, but it's sweet, so most people are gonna consider it as a fruit. Uh, here's some of the earliest apples uh, that were planted here in California. So this is in uh, Sacramento, and uh, <clears throat> some of the beginnings of the apples uh, are going to be the crab apples. So these are some crab apples, uh, very small, uh, very tart, 
And so as people started to find and hybridize and select apples, then they came up uh, with all the varieties that we know today. But apples probably had their origin as a very small fruit uh, with uh, probably dispersed by birds. And the origin is going to be Asia. Uh, and so from a very tiny crab apple, uh, we can then uh, see how uh, the other ones came about. So here's a, a crab apple and here's uh, two of them under my hand. Uh, and then we can have uh, see some of uh, the others that have become a little bit bigger, uh, such as this one. And then eventually that led to some of the bigger crab apples that are made into pies and a bunch of other things. Uh, usually to tart, unless you like tart fruit. Uh, so here's some of the crab apples and that led to the big ones, the Golden Delicious, the Red Delicious, the Granny Smith, and uh, all the others that you might be familiar with, uh, including our gala and now uh, the others. Uh, a few years ago in our fruit lab, we had the opportunity to sample uh, different varieties of apples that you could find around here. So we had, I think, 15 varieties of apples uh, on one uh, day and we sample them and those of you who took propagation and know the fruit lab uh, know what uh, that is all about. Uh, so Autumn Glory uh, I would consider to be the third or the fourth best tasting apple in uh, available so if you've not had it uh, check the stores uh, you might see it pretty soon. Uh, Pink Pearl, I've only found it once uh, and I'm looking for it again. It is pink inside and there's going to be apples that will have other colors inside, not just the white. Uh, this is known as either Green Dragon or Emerald Green or Emerald Sweet. Uh, it's probably the best green apple. Uh, very sweet as opposed to most folks who have eaten the Granny Smith. I uh, would we'll probably not like to uh, think that this is tart, but it is not. And uh, Envy, if there was an apple that I would say would be the best right now is Envy. And uh, if you look at Envy and where it came from, New Zealand, there are many, many very good apples that are being bred and uh, introduced from New Zealand, as well as if you get a chance to eat an apple that is grown in New Zealand, they are a lot better. Uh, than California and the Chilean, which is where most of the apples will be grown. So uh, apple sauce, obviously you were young once, uh, a child, so we all grew up with apple sauce. Uh, apple butter and uh, dry apples and apple juice. In the school, you had your apple juice or your orange juice. Uh, and uh, apple cider, if you want to now start getting into the more adult beverages. And uh, chicken and apple sausages, yeah, we don't do that. Uh, vinegar, apple uh, vinegar. Uh, and so from uh, the uh, apples, uh, genus malus, uh, we can go into the genus pyrus, which is going to be our pear. Uh, this is uh, our company, our evergreen pear grown uh, here at Signal Hill Park. Uh, our civic center. Uh, so showing us the flower. So we'll use this ornamental individual as kind of the type specimen. Uh, so here's uh, the abundance of uh, blossoms with the, the bee as a natural pollinator. Uh, so here's a close up. And so when we look at the pear from this, uh, this evergreen pear, it's very small, almost like a crab apple. So once again, the original pear was probably something tiny like this where people now selected and made it out to something bigger. Uh, pears do not really grow around here. They don't like the climate. However, people uh, have managed them. So here's uh, North Long Beach uh, on the street. I found this Pyrus communis, which is your typical pear with uh, fruit. Uh, so it's doing its job. It doesn't look as happy, but hey, it's getting pears. Uh, and so when we look at one side of the pear, just like the apple, we'll see the remnants of the flower parts. And then when we cut it, uh, we see exactly the same thing as the apple. So you have the dividing line of the actual uh, 
carpo, the ovary, uh, which is the core, and then uh, the fleshy portion that you eat will be those, uh, the swollen uh, base of the petals and sepals, the floral tube, the hypanthium, however you want to refer to it. So it's another poem. Uh, so here's some of the different pairs, the Bartlett pair or the Asian pairs. Uh, Asian pears is its own species. They're not hybrid as people may think. Uh, and so here's just an assortment of the different pears uh, that you might see out in the store, including some of the Asian pears that are quite big. And that's a, a meal in itself. Uh, and there's a bunch more. And a bunch more. And uh, the commis pears, which is this one. Uh, pears, uh, canned pears for desserts, uh, dried pears, and obviously pear uh, honey tea. Uh, and then, uh, so from pears, uh, we can look at our loquat, Eribotria. It is loquat season right now, so they should be ripening. Uh, so look out in the neighborhood and you see some trees. Uh, so here's uh, the fruit, uh, sorry, the flower. Uh, and uh, there's uh, the flowers, the stem and the sepals and everything else. And here is uh, the fruit. Uh, when it's golden yellow, it's ready to be eaten, uh, such as uh, this photograph. And uh, inside, you're going to have that fleshy portion and then the individual uh, uh, carpels. I would also add at this point in time, if you look at the literature, uh, you will see that loquats are considered poisonous. Uh, the fact is that almost every member of this family has cyanide, specifically in the seeds, and that is one of the reasons why we usually do not bite into the core of an apple or uh, eat the seeds. Now, I've heard of people who save the seeds and eat them later on, uh, but there has been some cyanide uh, poisoning of people from eating uh, members of this family, or at least the seeds, not the fleshy portion, because that is nothing more than the swollen hypanthium. And so the seeds will have cyanide, so be very careful with them. Uh, and so here's the seeds uh, for our loquat and uh, the swollen hypanthium. A few other ornamentals, uh, cotoniaster, uh, here's a very large shrub, and uh, all the color uh, is done by the tiny uh, apple-like fruits that are not edible. So here's a flower with a few more of those fruits and a few more there. And uh, our native uh, toyan, uh, Hollywood berry. Uh, so this is native to uh, Southern California and the coastal and chaparral. And so when the Spanish or the started exploring the area, and started settling in the area, uh, they came across this plant. Uh, when they saw the leaves, they noticed that it was kind of prickly. They associated with uh, a European holly, and uh, they referred to that area as Hollywood, and that is where the name Hollywood stands uh, or came from. First, it was Hollywood land, because that's the land when all the hollies would grow, and that would be Hollywood Hills and then Hollywood. Uh, this season with the cold, there was some very nice display of them in our last hike. Uh, the fruits are edible. However, they are a little bit astringent, so do not eat them when they're too fresh. Uh, but once they have dried, uh, and if you eat them more like a trail mix, you can enjoy them, then they become sweeter. However, extreme consumption or large consumption of them will be exposing you to a lot of cyanide. So be very careful if you are gonna eat them on a regular basis. Uh, and there's a form that has uh, the yellow uh, fruits. A few other shrubs, uh, Photinia, Fraseri. Uh, this is a very common landscape plant. You'll see it out there, it's called red tops. Uh, and uh, also the Paracantha, fire thorn. Uh, thorn. Here's uh, some of the uh, cascading ones. Uh, and uh, here's the flowers that will later turn into a tiny uh, apple-like fruit. Uh, quince, uh, so Camelli is gonna be the genus for quince. Uh, most often people are gonna be growing our ornamental quince or flowering quince. 
because it's another plant that doesn't really like to be here. Uh, here's uh, in Tijuana where somebody is able to grow it and as a street tree, kind of has a horrible life, but uh, there's uh, quince uh, there uh, at the stores. Here it is. Some people like to eat them fresh. I think they're a little bit too astringent and a little bit too tart. So most often people will make them into some kind of uh, pastry, pie, or into the uh, jams and jellies or something else. So they have to be processed to really be eaten. Uh, here's some flowering quince. Once again, no petals, already a mutated uh, or individual selected. Uh, we have the very popular Indian hawthorn, Raphilepis indica. Uh, so very common everywhere. Uh, here it is as a tree. Uh, this is by the old Holes Food uh, next to Seal Beach. Uh, second PCH, I guess. Uh, so here's the flowers for this. And uh, here's uh, uh, the flowers and uh, the fruits at their beginning, not edible. Uh, but something that is edible, uh, here is uh, uh, the genus Cretagia, which is the real hawthorn. So Indian hawthorn is just a common name, but there is a true uh, hawthorn, uh, this one being Mexican hawthorn. Uh, Mexican hawthorn is also known in Spanish as tejocote, which is a very important fruit uh, and for many years it was one of the fruits that was confiscated uh, in the border, Tijuana border, during the Christmas season. Uh, that is because it is important for making the Mexican uh, fruit punch or Christmas punch and so people would smuggle them and try to get them in. Uh, here's uh, a quince, uh, one, one of the oldest one in, uh, planted in Sacramento with a very tiny fruit uh, there. So from this tiny fruit, the bigger quince uh, were developed. And so here's uh, that. So we have some hawthorn extracts, some medicine or supplements. Uh, we do have some uh, hawthorn berries. So these are freeze dry and uh, they're a little bit tart, but if you see them. I'll try them. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, so hawthorn berries, cool berries uh, right there. And uh, in Carolina, we have the Carolina ironwood. Uh, the Carolina ironwood, at some point, it had its distribution throughout the mainland. So they have found uh, fossil records of them throughout uh, the mainland. But as the climate changed and things started to separate, it became a exclusive Channel Island uh, uh, native plant. Uh, so this is when I had the opportunity to see the nice grove that is found in Carolina. And as you venture into the different Channel Islands, uh, there might be a slight variation on the different populations that you might see. Uh, so here's uh, the tree with a very nice uh, bark. And uh, here's the flowers for this individual, not edible, uh, but a very important uh, native, California native endemic. And now it has been planted uh, throughout Southern California as a native plant, a native tree, one of the few native trees. Uh, in the Amagalangoidae, um, uh, amigo, amigildaloides. <laughs> uh, uh, so we have uh, uh, the other important fruits, uh, namely the genus Prunus. Uh, which is going to have our Prunus persica, uh, known as peach. So here we have flowering peaches. Uh, somewhere in the 60s, people decided that fruits were very dirty. And so this, they started to develop all this really nice, fancy, fruitless variety that would just flower and that's it. Uh, so these are the multi-double. Uh, fl uh, flowering peach. But when we look at the real peach flower and we cut it in half, uh, now we're going to find that the hypanthium is not, no longer going to play a role in uh, itself. So you can see here creating a oral tube, kind of holding uh, the ovary. It's going to be separate. We have the stigma and the petals and the sepals and everything else. 
Uh, here is the beginnings of uh, the peach as it's now beginning to grow, flower parts uh, now withering away. Uh, here is as it gets older and the flower parts withering away. And uh, here's a few more. Uh, so when we take that ovary and now we grow it into a peach, now we're going to see something very different. So now the walls of the ovary will become the fleshy portion. And inside uh, the fruit, there is going to be one single seed that is going to be surrounded by a very hard shell. Uh, and that is going to be the peach seed. Uh, so one single seed with a hard shell. Uh, this also makes uh, the common name for the plant that is known as stone fruit because if you bite into them, it's going to feel as if you bit into a stone. And the fruit for peaches is going to be known as a drupe. That would be the scientific word for the peach fruit. Uh, so we have different types of peaches out there, uh, different size. We have uh, the donut peach, and the donut peach is just a selection that aborts the seed early on. Uh, the flesh continues to develop, but because the seed does not really grow into its normal size, it's deformed. And so you have just the growth of the fleshy portion and not the seed inside. So it's just a, an abortion uh, of uh, the embryo uh, giving us uh, those uh, donut peaches. Here's uh, a few more and uh, a few more you might see other uh, yellow uh, peaches uh, can and some people really like them uh, some people don't uh, for making pies and candies and uh, here's uh, the seed uh, the seed on a peach is really nasty tasting i'm not sure if you ever had a chance to bite into one it's a lot of cyanide uh, so please stay away from it uh, but here's uh, the uh, woody shell that protects the seed. And uh, here's uh, uh, the ovary uh, from, uh, and then the seed of a peach, and then the seed of an almond, uh, just for scale, so you can see it. Uh, so here's uh, the other campus uh, with uh, a flowering peach uh, that's uh, probably already done blooming. Uh, and uh, Almonds do not really grow in Southern California. It is very rare to find an almond tree. So up north where it gets cold, perfect area. However, uh, I did manage to find an almond tree. So Prunus uh, dulcis. Uh, dulcis meaning sweet. Uh, it's uh, a selection, a plant that has uh, abandoned uh, the cyanide. So that's why it is perfectly okay for you to eat uh, almonds and not get cyanide poisoning because they don't have any. So plants have evolved differently. So right by Hill in San Francisco, uh, I was walking, uh, looking for trees and I came across uh, this individual uh, that doing very well and uh, being protected. And obviously what told me what it was, was uh, the peach, uh, sorry, the almond, uh, the fruit. Uh, the fruit that was still green uh, when I came across it, I took only one plant, fr a fruit, I swear, just for, so that I can take a photograph. And you can see uh, the shell of uh, the almond that if this was a peach, this would be the fleshy portion. In most cases with almonds that get discarded. And so you have the more of the brittle shell on the almonds and inside you have uh, the seed, the one seed. Uh, so here's the uh, plant. So I went back in the winter, it goes dormant, and then uh, I went back another time and it was probably one of the nicest trees that I've seen, uh, full of flowers. Uh, and here's close up of those uh, almond flowers. So very, very nice. So very few trees around and this one here on the west side of Long Beach is probably one of the nicest uh, almonds are eaten green. So in the Mediterranean, when the almonds are green and they are, and the seed is not hard, they sell them as a delicacy. So it, they're kind of sour, a little bit acid. So normally they are going to be eaten with salt. But if you never had 
fresh green almonds. You might want to try it because they're, they're interesting. Uh, so look at uh, some of the Mediterranean Lebanese stores, uh, they might have them. Uh, so, and if you let them mature, then they become the almonds for the, our trail mix, which is nothing more than the seed. Uh, there's uh, almond extract uh, from the oil. And then uh, in the genus Prunus, uh, Abidus, uh, this is going to be our cherry. Uh, once again, cherries do not really grow well here. Uh, most of the commerce, uh, except there's a variety that they claim can go by the can grow by the beach, uh, requiring chill hours, uh, which a chill hours are the number of hours that the plant needs to have cold period during the winter. And uh, around Long Beach, it's very very mild. So uh, any fruit that requires under 200 hours of chill hours can possibly give you fruits here. Uh, and that is why we cannot grow peaches, not uh, not peaches, but cherries and uh, almonds and most of the apples because they require a lot more chill or cold period that we can provide them here in Long Beach. Uh, there's a variety that I grew in the garden. It grew, uh, but I was only able to harvest like two or three fruits for that entire tree. Uh, so here's the ones from Commerce uh, on the cherries. Uh, very popular as summer comes in and uh, if we take the fruit it's exactly like a peach with one single seed inside and the fleshy portion that you eat. Once again, cyanide inside the seeds, so do not eat them. And there is a seed for some of the cherry trees. Uh, cherries for canning, so very important. Cherries for uh, supplements. And uh, there are some uh, native cherries. So here is our catalog. trees, a historic area. Uh, here is the tree uh, and uh, it's doing quite well. And uh, there's the beginning of the flowers that will later turn into the fruit. So if people wish to eat a cherry, then the subtropical, which does not require the cold period, would be a good alternative. Uh, and there it is. Uh, and then uh, in Balboa Park in the valley, uh, there was a gardener who came from Japan and uh, there is this uh, lake called Balboa Lake and he determined that it was a perfect climate for growing the pink cloud variety. Uh, and so here's when they were in full bloom a couple of years ago. Uh, so there is a variety called pink cloud or Huntington uh, pink cloud that can grow here. And I think South Coast Botanic Garden does have a cherry festival when their cherry trees are uh, blooming. You can go see them. There's some weeping cherry trees uh, that you can find, but not suitable for our, our area, uh, but they're quite nice. Uh, or Prunus cerasifera. Uh, this is going to be a plum. Uh, plum, which is going to be this our evergreen, uh, sorry, uh, flowering plum. Uh, so here's a flower, here's uh, the multi blossom. Uh, but plums also have a very sour fruit. Uh, some of the new selections are much better, uh, but most of the original plums were probably also very small and very sour. And uh, there's some of uh, the better ones. Uh, plums have now been extremely hybridized, so there's a several plums. Uh, apricot hybrids, several plums, and other plants, uh, fruit hybrids. Uh, Prunus armeniaca uh, is going to be our apricot. Uh, so the apricot that probably has its origin in Asia, but taken into uh, <clears throat> Armenia or uh, <coughs> copy please. Early on, <clears throat> so 
<coughs> if you're able to grow in either tree ripe apricots, nothing beats them. Everything in the store is really bad. So <clears throat> just like a plum, but much, much sweeter. And uh, some people really love them. I, I definitely like them. And I'll eat them anytime I get a chance. Uh, so uh, apricots, prunus armeniaca. And so here are some of the hybrids. Uh, plum cuts uh, and a bunch of other things. Uh, sometimes known as uh, dinosaur egg uh, plums and all that. So apricot jam, uh, dry apricots, all of them are very, very good for you. And even some, an assortment of different uh, alcoholic beverages, some with strawberries, some with cherries, raspberries, and apples. So there's a little bit for everybody. Uh, and different types of vinegars for uh, food. Uh, on top of the mountains, so California, there are some high altitude members of this family. So yes, they grow on top of the mountains. So here, Petrophyton, here grown in uh, what is now California Botanic Garden, uh, used to be Rancho Santana Botanic Garden. So it was in full flower when I was there. Very low growing, as we've seen with some other uh, very high altitude plants and a very large display of flowers uh, here. And so that kind of completes uh, the seminar. So uh, I just want to, uh, there's a discussion when I upload it. And uh, I, I had to say that you can grade me on my first uh, webinar uh, and see how, how I did. Uh, but I'm sure I'm going to get a tense out of all of you. Uh, so I'll post it and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get uh, more of this uh, up and going. So thank you and uh, have a great day.